Bill Schultz here. I want to welcome everybody to the Hungry Heart Service in Jackson, Tennessee. We are so grateful you decided to tune in and watch us, whether it's live today or on YouTube later. And uh, today we're going to talk about some great verses in Scripture that kind of change everything. So to set the stage for that, uh, in, in several of my prophecy messages, I did not spend enough time on Tohu and Bohu because I got saved in the Worldwide Church of God. Mr. Armstrong was teaching that from the 1950s. I just kind of mistakenly presumed everybody already understood that between Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 and Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, something happened. And you kind of take it for, advantage, for granted. And so I didn't really teach on it as extensively as I needed to. And I was going to get into uh, Passover today, but I haven't got it all, to, pulled it all together. I'm not going to get all those up in time because I don't have that many messages before Passover. But we're going to film them, and we're going to put them in an, an album, all of the great new things the Lord has taught us in the last uh, 15 years about the Passover. It's going to be an exciting thing. And then we're going to do one not just on Passover, but we're going to do one for all of the holy days where you'll kind of get the overview of Passover uh, along with the overview of all the Holy Days. So this is what we're kind of working on right now, hoping to have that to you by Shavuot at least, that you'll be able to have the full Holy Day set. Passover set should be done sometime around Passover. But uh, God bless everybody. Thank you so much for watching today. We're going to get into some deeper teaching. And I want to preface these remarks by saying, when you start keeping the Saturday Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, from Friday night sundown to Saturday night sundown, it changes a lot of things in your Christian theology. And uh, I can't really help that. Uh, I was talking with a, a, a doctor, my doctor this week, and said some things, and she couldn't really follow it because of her Sunday theology would not let her go there. But Sabbath changes everything, amen? You understand that Elohim is father and son, not a trinity. It's father and son. It's a family. And that many of us are being brought into that. So I was watching a prophecy teacher this week, and he was saying that the snake in the garden tricked Eve into thinking she could be God without God. Okay, he did that, by the way. But it's not as if God hadn't already laid out a plan where you can be a part of the God family by coming to Yeshua Messiah and receiving the Spirit of God. So... Right now, it's a big thing in the news for all of the super rich and famous people that they think they can gain eternal life by becoming a cyborg. And we're all laughing in here because the only way to get to eternal life is to accept Jesus as your Savior and be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the only way to get to eternal life, and it's a free gift. You can have it. All you got to do is repent of your transgressions of Torah. But see that there again, when you're in Sunday, you don't see Torah as something you got to keep. But when you're in Sabbath, you already know Torah is something that you got to keep. So that obedience, it opens the door. So I got a question this week about is the, the gates of heaven only open on Shabbat? Not necessarily. They're really only open on atonement. But the Lord will come to be with us where two or three of us are gathered together in his name. There he is in the midst of us. So there's a lot of things with Shabbat that will bring the presence of the Lord if that's what your purpose is on Shabbat. So there's just a lot of things Sabbath changes. And uh, a lot of it has to do with Bible prophecy. So I'm going to go ahead and, and, and flip this uh, chart here. Uh, I've got some charts made for you today. And uh, because I, I want to start in Genesis chapter 1, and I want you to see the Tohu and Bohu. Now, I don't even have all of the stuff I had in Worldwide to go back and pull Mr. Armstrong's work for you. I have some of it, but not all of it. But uh, I wanted to just give you a quick update on this as we go on in. Now, you know, I do my own original work. I don't study from anybody else. I go in the prayer closet, I get what Yeshua tells me, and I study the Bible. That's how I get everything I present. I'm not interested in what other teachers teach, even though when I'm done with the study, I will look around to see if anybody else is teaching what I'm teaching. And lo and behold, a lot of these new things that people think are crazy that I've been teaching, you have a Pentecostal minister in Osage Beach, Missouri, Larry Allison. You've heard me mention him before. He's teaching a lot of it. But now he's got that Sunday perspective, so it only goes so far, and then it kind of makes that left turn. Another one is Chuck Missler. 
Chuck Missler is a very famous scientist, and I guess he moved uh, to New Zealand at some point, but he left the, the, the academic world, the scientific world, the governmental work, where he did a lot of work on the space program, among other things. And he became a church man and raised up a, a church, and it's called Koinonia House after Koine Greek. And so he goes into how the Messiah couldn't really spread the gospel until there was a universal language, Koine Greek, that was spoken all over the world, and how they had to have Pax Romana, the American peace, I mean the Roman peace that would allow people to travel and move around because before you had so much warfare you couldn't really travel from here to there there was a war going on over there you might have to flee the other direction but you're not going over there so a lot of these writers there there were several more Skywatch News I don't know if you ever watched Skywatch News on TV but they're talking about a lot of these same things but again they, they miss certain things like angels can't really reproduce with human women and there's a lot of reasons for that we're going to touch on some of them today but if you believe that then what they said would make a lot of sense to you if you believe that angels could mate with women then you could see where that would make sense but we know we know different so i will start in tohu and bohu so in genesis 1 verse 1 it said in the beginning god made created the heavens and the earth now the hebrew here implies perfection it's created perfect. It wasn't created messed up. And, and God's going to say that. And we're going to go to a verse where God says, I did not create it in Tohu and Bohu. Now in verse 2 it says, Now the earth was formless and empty. And um, as you can see, um, Tohu, formless, chaos, Bohu, empty, desolation. Right? And I get this from other passages in the scripture. But when you look these words up, the, uh, there's a lot of meaning to both of these words. There's like four or five different words that are similar but not quite exact. That's why sometimes I use a Hebrew word in prayer. Like, see, this was our week to pray in Corinth. I used some Greek words, and they're like, I never heard you use those before. Well, I looked up what the English was because sometimes it's not very clear, our English mistranslation. So I looked up the Greek words, and the Greek words conveyed a whole lot more meaning than, I didn't want to write all that, right? You get tired of making this list every time you want to use a word. Sometimes I want the list, sometimes I don't. So I just used the Greek words and was done with it. But uh, th these can be the results of war. Now in the Hebrew here, the word was, that particular verb in the Hebrew would be better translated became. Now, I was watching uh, Chuck Missler uh, message here this week, and he went through all of the Hebrew entomology for why became is better. Mr. Armstrong, back in the day, did the same thing, went through all the Hebrew entomology, why it was became. Now, you know, look, it, all of us are Americans, and we should understand the conjugation of be verbs, right? Be became, same word. Am, are be became was you know they're all that's all the be verbs right it's not all of them there's eight of them i don't remember them all anymore that was back when i was in the seventh grade i'm retired now <clears throat> all right so here you have this and and, and you can see now we're going to go through these verses first we're going to go to jeremiah 4 and verse 23 and we're going to see tohu and bohu jeremiah 4 if I can get over there. They want to take a picture of this chart in Corinth, but their, their phone went out. Now, in Jeremiah 4 and verse 23, it says, I looked at the earth, and it was Tohu and Bohu, and the, he at the heavens, and their light was gone. So, Tohu and Bohu. So he looked, and it was Tohu and Bohu. He didn't, he didn't make it that way, and I'm asking you, is that the result of the angelic war? I think it is the result of the angelic war, because they all came down here to build this uh, utopian paradise to put Adam and Eve in. It was, they were never meant to be naked and afraid in the Garden of Eden. It was meant that they were going to be put down into a fully functioning civilization <coughs> where the sons of Adam could be raised up to be the sons of God. <coughs> 
But we know it didn't work out that way, did it? Well, praise be to Yeshua Messiah that he came down and fixed all that and put us back on the track to be the children of God. Hallelujah. All right, so I want to go to Isaiah 45. And you're going to see what God has to say about this. He says a lot in Isaiah 44 and Isaiah 45. He says a lot of amazing things. <clears throat> now, in Isaiah 45 and verse 18, he says, Let me make sure I got them. I got to go to Jeremiah. Let's go to Isaiah 34 first. Isaiah 34 first. I want to show you the um, the results of war. So he's talking about Edom, a day of vengeance for Edom. And in Isaiah 34 and verse 11, he says, God will stretch out over Edom the measuring line of Tohu and the plumb line of Bohu. Now he's talking about military conflict. The Assyrians did this to the Edomites, by the way. The Assyrians, when they were overrunning everybody in Canaan, they destroyed the Edomites, and they made Edom Tohu and Bohu. The results of war. Now let's go back to Isaiah 45, and let's see what God did in Genesis 1 and verse 1. Isaiah 45 and verse 18. For this is what the Lord said. He who created the heavens, he is God. He fashioned it and made the earth. He founded it. He did not create it, Tohu and Bohu, but formed it to be inhabited. So in Genesis 1 and verse 1, the God Almighty formed the earth to be inhabited. It was ready to go. He did not make it, Tohu and Bohu. Now, you know, again, I kind of took this for granted because this was taught so much, and then I realized, you know, I've never really taught on that. And a lot of people don't really know that. And I actually had someone bow up on me when I went from Genesis 1 to Genesis 2 and said that was the angelic war. It became formless and empty, and she was sticking right to the letter of the King James, and I'm like, it wasn't written in that. Oh, it's the ac most accurate translation. Well, no, it's really not. I hate to tell my King James buddies that. I mean, I, you know, lo lo love your version. I mean, I read it for almost 20 years. I mean, I still have one. I still remember verses in King James English, you know, because I read it so much. But it didn't really convey it, and this NIV doesn't convey it any better, really. Tohu and Bohu, chaos and desolation. They, they, they come from the results of war. And a lot of folks don't understand that. All right, so where did that war come from? And what are the other ramifications of that war? Now, people want to say that the devil's name is Satan, and the devil's name is not Satan. Satan means adversary, and it's used of the whole high command, not the individual. Now, in Isaiah 14, he is called Lucifer, or the NIV calls him son of the morning star. The same lady that bowed up on Tohu and Bohu bowed up right there. And then I told her what, what it was, and she looked it up on her phone, and that was the end of the argument. But the point is this. People read the English. They never dig any deeper. But, and sometimes there's no deeper to dig. Sometimes you look something up, and it's like, okay, they, you know. But sometimes you find hidden jewels. Now, we gave a message on Unleavened Bread a few years ago called Yeshua ben Avi, our conquering hero. And it was common in ancient times when one king conquered another, he took all of his titles. So recently somebody, you know, made a comment on Facebook, we're not hung up on titles. Let me tell you something. Is my firm policy from the beginning of this ministry that I don't ordain anybody until Yeshua tells me to do it. And when he tells me to do it, I'm hunting you down with the oil. It doesn't matter where you go. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do because I don't want to get messed up with, with Yeshua. You know, my, my relationship with Jesus, Yeshua Messiah, is, means more to me than anything else on this earth. So whatever he tells me to do, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. <clears throat> so titles, when they're conveyed by Yeshua, mean a lot. If titles are just co conveyed by a committee of men, they mean absolutely nothing. Tells you what they thought about their titles, nonetheless. 
They also took the robe and the train of the robe off of every conquered king. So we clipped off your royal authority and he would attach it to his own robe. So when, when Yeshua comes into the temple, the train of his robe filled the temple. Why? Because he's conquered all the kings. Every one of their robes is on his train. Every one of their titles he possesses. Because see, in the, in, the, in, in the NIV here, in Isaiah 14, it doesn't say, O Lucifer. It says, O morning star of the dawn. Well, that's a title Yeshua has. Did he take it from Hillel when he beat him down? I'm just saying these are things to question. So let's go to Ezekiel 28. <clears throat> now, uh, one of the things that uh, is going around in the Sunday world right now is that these fallen angels, and they have a lot of verses for it, but they also fit the way we look at it. They fit better, actually, the way we look at it. But <clears throat> I'm not going to get into giants. i got one more study to do before I <clears throat> think about that. But <clears throat> right now I'm working on time. So I'm never going to set a date. I'm just going to set the table for the season we're in. Because he said you're not going to know the hour or the day. He didn't say you wouldn't know the month or the year. But anyway, so Ezekiel 28 and verse 18, talking to Hillel, it says, By your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. It's a word play on his name. Hillel, you halaled your halal. So one use of the word halal is to desecrate. Another use of the word halal is sanctuary. So in this passage it says, by your sin, many sins of dishonest trade, you halaled your halal. So God loves a good wordplay. God loves a good wordplay. Lorenzo, be proud. Then he says, so I made a fire come out from you. And it consumed you, and I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who are watching. So this got presented to me in the late 90s, early 2000s by a, uh, an elder. I don't know if I should use his name. I would. Uh, I don't want to not give him credit. But anyway, uh, this elder used to be in the Worldwide Church of God, and when it all broke apart, he just kind of never found a new home. He'd already studied some stuff and couldn't go to the, the <clears throat> Worldwide Offshoots. <clears throat> and he pointed this verse out to me and says, Hillel has been reduced to ashes. And I had a hard time with this verse. I couldn't understand what he was telling me. I kind of put it on the shelf. Then when the Lord had me do the study a number of years ago, this verse comes up. And it took me a while to figure it. Because, I mean, you're so used to seeing the red man with the horn and the pointed tail and a pitchfork, right? I mean, you know, it, and think about it, guys. In Sunday school, they give you the most basic skim-the-top teaching so you can just kind of sort of have an idea. Because you're too young to understand the complexities and all the depth of those many details. So people look at the creation week. Oh, God created the earth, and then he made the sun, and he made this, and he made that. And then on the seventh day, they, they usually skip the seventh day. I don't know why they skip making the Sabbath on the seventh day, but they do. They, they skip it. Now, the Presbyterians taught it, and I can remember as a little boy going up to my grandmother's calendar and counting it off and going, well, why don't we go to church on Saturday? It's the seventh day. She didn't like that, but anyway. Obvious observation from a young child. Seven, I can count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven, eight, Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Your calendar's wrong, Grandma. <laughs> We're going to church on Sunday. That should be the seventh day. Calendar's not wrong, Billy. You know, I'm thinking, okay, well, the churches are all wrong then because it clearly says seven. <laughs> All righty, so how do you reduce somebody to ashes? Now, Mr. Armstrong taught that angels were eternal. Seems kind of silly to think about it that way now. I don't know where he got all this stuff, right? <clears throat> he said he read some books. Now, Mr. Armstrong did a lot of his work on books that were printed in the late 18 and very early 1900s. And there were a lot of books then that had a lot of things to say about angels, and Mr. Armstrong tried to square that circle. But we overlooked this verse right here. Now, there is a Satan who's going to get kicked out of second heaven. See, that's what was like, I don't understand. And then it dawned on me. He burned their bodies to ashes. 
their spirit still here. So human beings do not have a ghost. You have a spirit that goes back to God when you die unless you have re- accepted Jesus and been filled with the Holy Spirit, in which case your new body, your new spirit man goes to heaven when you die. Calm down, everybody. It's just going for dinner. We're coming right back. <clears throat> but, well, you know, ex Worldwiders would trip on that because they, 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 think, they think you're in what they, the Pentecostals call soul sleep until Jesus comes back to rule. And there is a verse that says some of those people will be resurrected when Jesus comes back to rule. But it also says some of us get resurrected when he blows the shofar and we are paid zoo to heaven. All right. So, you know, I'm just saying. So then, these are angel ghosts. All of these demonic spirits are angel ghosts. You know, like Casper. And that's why they, 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 they try to trick people. They, they come back and they, they put on the image of somebody that lived in the house. Maybe they possess that person because they know everything about them. And, you know, the ghost will do little things in the house. And, oh, it's that person that used to live here. No, it's not that person. That person didn't have the Holy Spirit. They, they, they ain't here. And if they do, they're, they're in heaven. They ain't coming back till they get resurrected with their body, whether that's at, at the rescue or whether that's when Jesus sets comes back to rule i mean either way they're not they're not doing anything but the demons are here all right so i'm gonna ask you a question let's go to isaiah 14 and we're going to look at verses 9 to 10 now you got two chapters talking about hell l and the satanic realm and one of them is isaiah 14 and one of them is ezekiel 28 These are your two chapters that give you all the usable information. Now, in verse 9 and 10, it says, The grave below is all astir to meet you at your coming. It rouses the spirits of the departed to greet you. Now, Solomon said the dead know nothing. And he's dealing with a lot of non-Holy Ghost baptized people because only the school of the prophets in Solomon's time had the Holy Spirit and everybody else did not so he's looking at all these people who were just normal in their flesh carnal people when they die they know nothing he said well well, what's the difference between a man and an animal because they both go to the same place right that was the extent of the revelation in, in Solomon's day so who are these spirits of the departed to greet you all those who were leaders in the world it makes them rise from their thrones all those who were kings over the nations well look in this time the only nation that's not entirely pagan is israel Every other nation is full of pagans. So how can you believe that these pagan kings that are in total opposition to the God of Israel have spirits in the grave? But isn't there an abyss where a lot of these demon spirits are in prison right now? In the abyss, waiting on release at the end of time? They will all respond. They will say to you, you also have become weak as we are. You have become like us. So evidently, all the rebellious angels got disembodied. Maybe Satan, maybe Hillel had to come to the throne of God, and they did it right there in front of Avi and everybody, and the rest got disembodied here, and then he gets cast back to earth. Because a lot of people think the Tohu and Bohu comes from Satan hitting, crashing onto the earth. I think that has a big part to play in it, but I think it's the general result of the angelic warfare. All right, we're going to go to Revelation 12 in a minute. And in Revelation 12, it talks about the dragon sweeps a third of the stars down from heaven into earth, but it says it's an astronomical sign. I do not think Hillel was clever enough to get a third of the angels to rebel. I mean, the more you think about that, the more absurd it seems, right? A third of the angels rebel, created at the hand of Yeshua, standing before Avi, praising his name. Did a third rebel? Probably not. 
Probably not. Because there was warfare on earth. If you go to a place like Saxe Woman, where you see an angelic structure built with stones no human being could build, and those stones are cut so precisely that it's less than one hundredth of an inch between the stones, and they fit together like that. So that means they had to be laser cut, essentially. You're not doing that with hand tools to a hundredth of an inch, to less than a hundredth of an inch. You're not doing that with hand tools. So these angels built these cities, but there's impact craters all around that thing. So there was a big war. And we got Tohu and Bohu. And you would think angels would be quite high tech, and they, they are. All right, now let's go back to Ezekiel 28 because he makes this statement. Now, you know, back in the day, I would have told you that the first part of Ezekiel 28, the prince of Tyre, had to do with the human being. But there's things in there that couldn't be the human being. And then that the back part where it talks about the king of Tyre. Now that's Hillel. That's the devil. But look at, look at the bottom of verse 7. Pierce your shining splendor. No man's ever had shining splendor. Now he does say, to the other's credit, up here in verse 2, but you are a man and not a God, though you think you're as wise as a God. I think it has more to do with mortality. I created you, you are mortal. See, Mr. Armstrong taught that angels were immortal, but I, I could never find a verse that says they are eternal. So I guess God could destroy anything he created. I would think, I would think. But in verse 8, he says this. <clears throat> They're going to bring you down to the pit. You will die a violent death in the heart of the seas. In the heart of the seas. So they're entombed in the seas. It's going to be important later on. Now, <clears throat> when I started studying the, the four beasts of Daniel 7, it, the chapter opens, and we'll go there after a while, with the four winds of heaven churning up the sea. And then the beasts come out. Now, we didn't <clears throat> finish reading that in verse Genesis 1, verse 2. But the end of the verse is the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. So, is that the Spirit of God is vibrating over the waters and locking these demons in the sea? Because as a result of the angelic war, they're entombed in the sea. There's all this chaos in the seas. Jesus goes out on the lake. A storm erupts immediately. Was that because the demons underneath are tripping that he's on the surface of the water above them? And then he just speaks a word. Quiet! And everything is still. And the disciples, experienced fishermen who've been fishing on that lake their whole lives, they had a very lucrative Roman concession. It wasn't like they show you in the, uh, the Chosen where Peter was broke and he's fishing on Shabbat because he's broke. No, these guys had a very lucrative, one of the few things you could do in, in the Holy Land at that time and make money was have a Roman fishing concession. So the Romans got a cut because they're not going to let anybody fish, but you and the other guys, they gave a concession. So essentially they're giving you a monopoly and you got to pay them. So you're guaranteed to make money. All right. Go back to a little history. It, it's all there. So why are these guys freaking out over the storm? I'll tell you, because the whole area is immersed in pagan mythology. And while it's a joke to us, oh, that's superstitious, don't be silly, it's a joke to us. To them, it was reality. They're seeing the pagan stuff happen. Why are they seeing pagan stuff happen back then? Because the demons are making it happen. Demons want a body. And as bad as we complain about ours, it will do just fine. Even if you're only going to live a few more years, they'll be happy to ride up in that thing with you for the next couple of years. They'll do anything. So they portray all of this as easy ways. Uh, I forget something we came across that, was, that seemed to have led to demon possession. It doesn't matter what they portray to you. Oh, you just do this. It's going to be great. You're going to get all this stuff. And next thing you know, whoa, you got a tenant who thinks they're in charge of your body. And does stuff in it you don't want to do. Yeah. 
because they ain't got your sense of morality and virtue. So you're not in control anymore. Tenants come in and, you know, you've been broke into. Strong man. Don't let the strong man in. I'm just telling you. <clears throat> now, another thing about this is in pagan mythology, and look, I didn't study a lot of this. This is just one of the things that just jumped out. Excuse me. The, the Egyptian small G-O-D, Osiris, is portrayed as the righteous savior of humankind who was killed. They always show him painted with the green face of death. You know, you go through different colors and then the mold grows and you turn green from the mold. They always show him green in death and he's entombed in the sea. <laughs> so they build this temple for him at Saqqara and there's four layers of, of, of caves and they're purposely flooded. Beautiful crystal clear water flooded in the desert. They built it to be flooded. Is that because his palace is entombed in the sea down in, in the ocean? That's crazy, isn't it? <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so we've established from the scriptures that Hillel and his associates are disembodied angels entombed in the sea. They're angel ghosts. They're angel ghosts. Now let's talk about Yeshua for a second. Over in Luke 24, he is going to show you something. Because a lot of people portray him as a spiritual nothing. He, he, he's just a spiritual and it's the power and he's, you know, all these ethereal things. But he didn't say that. That ain't what he said. That ain't what he said when he came out of the grave. He didn't say, I'm just the ethereal blah, blah, blah that's going to move you in your life and do this. He didn't say any of that. In verse 36, he says, while they were still talking about <clears throat> the road to Emmaus, <clears throat> Jesus himself stood among them. Now, if we're in here talking... Just fellowship and, and cutting up after church. And all of a sudden, Yeshua just shows up in bodily form. We're all going to think it's a ghost at first, right? Because he didn't walk through the door. He just showed up. <clears throat> and he said, Shalom. And they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. And he said, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It's I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones. As you see, I have. <clears throat> and when he showed them this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still didn't believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything to eat? So he ate a piece of fish. So he gave them all of these proofs that he is not a ghost. He is a resurrected person. I'm not going to say man because he's not a man anymore. He's back to being God. But since he had a human body, he carries around that Godship in a body. So I wrote in, in what God wants from you. How can it be that a man can become in the family of God? Well, it's simple. You do everything Jesus did because he showed us the way of how to turn your mortality into his immortality. That's why you've got to obey now. Get on board. <clears throat> All right. So Satan is a red dragon. Let's go to Revelation 12. A red dragon. <clears throat> Been watching a lot of films on this, by the way. <clears throat> and they're, they're amazing. <clears throat> so a great and wondrous sign appeared in the heavens. It's an astronomical sign. And we talked about Virgo with the sun over her, clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and the 12 stars. We talked about all these astronomical signs. And I told you last time that there's uh, standing or up in the sky near where her, her, her birthing would take place is a constellation called Serpents. And it's a snake with seven really bright red stars. And above it is a constellation of seven stars. So the seven heads are those seven stars. And it's got a crown of seven stars above it. 
and it's ready to devour the woman. <clears throat> now, this interesting, this constellation serpents has a head and it has a tail. To date, there has not been an astronomical sign where you see a meteor shower so big that it looks like a third of the stars are raining down on Earth from the tail area. <clears throat> but not to fear. We have an asteroid going by today, as a matter of fact. 1.7 million miles from Earth just missed us. <clears throat> it's the size of a modern skyscraper. If that bad boy hit to Earth, most of us would die. Okay. Now there's two coming, and I think it's 2028 and 2030, that are both big enough to be the asteroids you see in the back of the book of Revelation. One like a blazing mountain goes in the sea, and one falls on the rivers and the waters turn to blood. But they're going to try to break one of these up with a nuclear missile. Now that could end up being the meteor shower that looks like the dragon cast a third of the stars to the earth. Nonetheless, there's a lot of important clues to glean about the satanic high command, and it goes like this. Another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. So you got seven heads with crowns. Crowns mean kings. So why are we looking at Satan and thinking there's one? There's seven crowned heads. And there's ten horns. This is not an individual. This is, this is a group of these working mischief. Now in verse 9 it says, The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And his angels with him. I don't think a third of them rebelled, but nonetheless, you have seven crowned heads and ten horns. So let's take a look at this. Who are these crowned heads? In Isaiah 14, remember Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. This is where you find all your information. Well, most of it. From there, you find extraneous verses all over where you know God's talking about one thing and he just throws a throws a one liner out at the devil and he's talking about this and he throws another one liner out at the devil and if you're not prepared for it you just you just read out you, you know you're just reading you don't really catch it but after I started doing these studies they all started popping out you said what oh what whoa whoa well, look at this yeah hey look at here all right so Isaiah 14 and verse 18 all the kings of the nations lie in state each in his own tomb but you are cast out of your tomb like a rejected branch. Okay, normally the word branch is used for Messiah. Except we did that study back in 2012 and we found out that only half of them are for Messiah. The other half are for the righteous believers. And the difference is in the Hebrew, the, the, the Hebrew word. So the branch, this is all in uh, Zechariah by the way. The branch is netzer. Noon Zadi Resh. The righteous of God with the righteousness of God is the prince. Netzer. Here he's called Netzer. You are a rejected Netzer. The other word for branch is, is Samach. It's Zadi Mem Chet. The righteous of God with the baptism of the Holy Spirit enter eternal life. That's Samach. So, we're Samach the branches, and he's Netzer the vine. But evidently, Hillel was a Netzer, and when Jesus conquered him, he took his title. I think I'll take that. And in the other one, Morning Star of the Dawn, I think I'll take that too. We don't even know everything he took, because we don't know everything about what happened back up here in the Tohu and Bohu. But in the Tohu and Bohu, Yeshua took his stuff. He took all his toys worth taking, and entombed him in the sea. I got all your crowns. I got all your robes. I got all your authority. But Avi hasn't turned him loose to come down to earth and, and display it. In the meantime, he put us on earth and he said, take it from him. See, we read it in the old King James is man has dominion. But that's not what the Hebrew says. The Hebrew says, take it from him. So he put us down here and told us to take it from the devil. How do you take it from the devil? You live righteous lives. You follow Torah. 
you live righteous lives and you're taking authority and territory, by the way, ground from the devil. So when they want to tell you, oh, you need to do this little sin, psh, I got your power. I got your power. I took your game. I ain't giving it back. <laughs> you had a luck. You's a ghost after all. <laughs> all right. So who are these? Let's go to Ephesians <clears throat> 6 and verse 12. I am convinced that these seven crowned heads are the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's why they're going to get kicked out of heaven because they're in the heavenly realms. Can't get kicked out if you're not already there. Ephesians 6 and verse 12. <clears throat> Paul is going to list for you four classes of angelic leadership. We're going to find out in Daniel chapter 8 later on that they are at war with each other. <clears throat> Nonetheless, <clears throat> Ephesians 6 and verse 12, <clears throat> for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But the, de the devils always want to make us fight flesh and blood. The struggle is not flesh and blood, but against the rulers, <clears> Old <throat> King James's principalities, that's the principles over palities, or the municipal demons, the authorities, it's a whole word study right there on the authorities. <clears throat> the authorities would be like demons over a state or a country. <clears throat> and then uh, the, against the powers of this dark world, Cosmo Crator. I think these ten horns are the Cosmo Crator. That's what it's called, Cosmo Crator powers of this dark world I think the seven crowned heads are the, are the next batch the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms that is a totally accurate Greek translation spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms <clears throat> now let's uh, look at some uses of the word powers let's go to Isaiah 24 <clears throat> this is very near the uh, the verse where it says, hide in the chambers till the indignation be passed. That word for chambers means your apartment in heaven, by the way. We did a whole word study on that at a feast one year. <clears throat> so in Isaiah where he says, go my people, hide in your chambers until the indignation be passed. He's telling you, you're, he's going to hide you in your, your chamber in heaven. It's an apartment for the bride of a king. Well, we're supposed to be the bride of a king. We're going to hide in our you know, bridal apartment till the indignation be passed. Yeah, it works for me. Isaiah 24 and verse 21. <clears throat> he's talking about all the things that have happened on this earth. And, you know, as I've studied this and watched some other teachers, I've come to the conclusion that when... Avi throws down the wrath of God in the book of Revelation. It has nothing to do with people. See, we look at this whole Bible like everything's about us. We're so great, all us people. That's, that's just kind of hubris. I'm convinced the mark of the beast is demon possession. And there's a lot of, I have a lot of reasons for that. Maybe one day I'll do that, but it'd be kind of controversial today, so maybe I'll wait just a little longer. <clears throat> but... If that be the case, it means when the wrath of God is poured out, the only people on, on earth that are living have a demon. They're possessed. Mark of the beast. He kills everybody but the mark of the beast. So that means everybody's demon possessed. So in this case, Avi would be punishing these spirits that rebelled against him back here, have jacked up his people all through here, and now I've had enough. Human beings couldn't stand that. Man, if you had 200-pound hailstones falling from third heaven down to this earth, they would black, smash and break everything into pieces and it's burning with fire. Man, everybody would be out there, Uncle, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Why don't they repent? They can't repent because the, the demon tenants who are running this, their show now, they're just stuck. Yeah. Yeah. They're just stuck with that. All right, so it says in verse 22, verse 21, that day the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above 
and the kings on earth below. Going to punish the powers in the heavens above. That's heavy, right? What if those kings are the authorities and not human kings? I'm going to punish the powers in heaven and the authorities from Ephesians 6 on earth. <clears throat> now let's go to Daniel chapter 4. This is Nebuchadnezzar speaking after he has been a wild uh, animal for a couple of years. And uh, God brings him around. And he has this to say. <clears throat> In verse Daniel 4, verse 34. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I'm going to praise Daniel's God. He's not going to praise the one after whom he's named. He's not going to praise all the others. He's going to praise the Most High. Then I praise the Most High, honored and glorified Him who lives forever and ever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom, that's Shotan, by the way. His Shotan is an eternal Shotan. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. Didn't Isaiah say the same thing? The whole sum of humanity is the fine dust in the balance that doesn't even matter. So why do we think the whole Bible's about us? If we're the fine dust in the balance that you don't even bother to sweep it out between weighings, I mean, why would the whole Bible be about us? I'm convinced that the majority of this book is between him and the rebellious angels, and we just in the middle of this. You know that crazy song from the 70s, Stuck in the middle with you. <laughs> well, what was it on the left? And Joker's on the right? Yeah, <laughs> it perfectly conveys it, right? Then he says this, He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. So there's powers. Yeah, they're, they're the horns on this dragon. That's what he's talking about. I do what I want with the spiritual forces of evil and the horns on the dragon and the people on earth. They're just like second, second run. <clears throat> All right. Now let's talk about Mystery Babylon. Who's Mystery Babylon? Guys, I am so proud of this cover on The Next Pursuit. Yeah, it, my, it was my original idea, but Our Lady Kim at Allegra, she is the Jedi Master. She was able to make my vision come to pass. I mean, I got all the pieces on there, but I couldn't make them look right. And she was able to immediately capture my vision for that cover and make it so. It is the most stunning cover we've had on anything ever. And when you see it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to creep you out. So the, the, next, the next pursuit is about who is Mystery Babylon, and it will be a little more extensive than what we're going to do today. Today's just basic. So who is, who is Mystery Babylon? Who is this? You know, she's called a lot of stuff. I mean, we could use some foul language, but I won't. But Revelation 17, she shows up. This is not her first time to show up, by the way, but we missed her the first time she showed up because we weren't thinking about it because it's worded differently. Isaiah told us about it in the language of his time, right? And so that's how I deciphered a lot of the stuff on the four beasts is that the Lord showed me that they're the same as the first four writers of the seven seals on the scroll that Avi gives Yeshua. But John was given the vision in a way to explain to his generation and for future generations. And Daniel was given, a, given the vision in a way to explain to his generations. And I'm telling you, <clears throat> in the ancient world, they were all pagans, and even Israel was pagan more than they were not. They would, have, they would go pagan and get great revivals. They'd go pagan, get great revivals. Finally, God said, I've had enough. I've had enough. You're going bye-bye. <clears throat> So Genesis said, I mean, sorry, Revelation 17, verse 3. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit. He's not in the flesh. He was carried away in the spirit to see this. This is not something he was taken out into a hot, dry, sandy place, and there's this animal with a woman riding on it. He's in the spirit, and the word desert here does not mean hot, dry, sandy place. It means someplace remote. So he's carried to a remote place. It is essentially the uh, uh, Hebrew equivalent of the Midbar, right? 
So this is how I tied together this beast with Tanin is but all of the prophets were carried into the midbar in the spirit to see this thing. All right. <clears throat> I come, I will show you the, the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters, whether the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Some versions say maddening. And the Greek very definitely conveys an insanity that goes with the wine of her adulteries. So my question to you is, is this really wine? You know, liquid, pour it, in a, pour it in a cup, drink it? Or is it magic spells that have enraged insanity? Because, you know, I'm going to tell you, <clears throat> Book of Hosea is all about adultery is idolatry. And idolatry is adultery. The whole Book of Hosea is about that. He starts out, Hosea has to, has to marry a prostitute. And she can't stop. Was she demon-possessed? That's a way to get it. <clears throat> you know, holy matrimony, one man, one woman, married for life, monogamous. There's a spiritual component to that. It's supposed to be a worship experience. So the opposite, toweva, opens you to the demonic. Hmm. Now the spirit carried me away into the desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. <clears throat> so again, I think that's probably a group of demons operating. The woman's dressed in purple and scarlet was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with the abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. There's a lot of Greek words in there, and they're ugly. They do not have a good meaning. There's no way to get a good meaning. Pollution, lewd, pornea. <clears throat> so, pagan worship has a lot of illicit sex. As a matter of fact, if you do a little work on 1 Corinthians, the study notes will tell you that the temple of Aphrodite in Corinth had a thousand prostitutes at one time. That's a lot of genetic material. So I do not believe, because fallen angels are angel ghosts, I don't believe they could do anything with a woman. I don't believe they could do anything with a woman if they were embodied. <clears throat> the loyal angels would never think about doing something like that. <clears throat> so do these demon spirits create these giants from genetic manipulation? And is that why another reason for all of the crazy activity in a pagan temple is to get a big pool of genetic material to work with? And then artificially inseminating, right? Because the word for wife can also mean consort. Since they can't do anything with them, <clears throat> unless, of course, they possess somebody. So another question is, since paganism after the flood started with Nimrod and Semiramis, did Hillel possess Nimrod and Babs here possess Semiramis? From whom the whole thing spread all over the earth to at the time of Abraham, he was the only straight one. You think about these things for a minute. You know, God didn't just wipe out everybody in Noah's time because he was mean and harsh. He wiped them out because they had corrupted the genetic material. You got a gene pool problem. And only Noah and his three sons and their four wives were straight. So I'm going to rescue you because I got to preserve the gene pool because I said that the seed of the woman is going to crush the seed of the serpent. It's going to happen because I said it. But right now I got I to clear the decks because it's a mess. And then by the time of Abraham, it's still a mess. It's back to a mess. And he says, from you, I'm going to make a great nation, but get out of here. Get out of here. You know, <clears throat> so her, this title was written on her forehead, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, those who bore the testimony of Jesus. In another place, it says she is guilty of the blood of every righteous person. So that goes back to Abel, right? Goes back to Abel. <clears throat> so who is this? Now, in the next chapter... Starting in verse 2, 
this angel, this, this great big major authority, big time angel comes down and is illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouts, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She's become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit. That is a correct rendering, by the way. And this word up here in demons, she's become a home for demons. That word demons can also mean pagan gods. So, this word home, this word haunt, and the next word haunt are all the Greek word phylaki, and they can mean a prison. And in some versions, it's said that she imprisoned them. And in the last one, it says, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. So, she's got unclean spirits in cages like birds. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Is this because that she has held these spells on all of these kings, both demonic and human? We're going to see some verses in Isaiah that are going to mess your thinking up. <clears throat> now in verse 7, <clears throat> bottom of verse 7, in her heart she boasts, I sit as a queen, and I am not a widow, and I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day her plagues will overtake her, death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. When the kings of the earth who committed... All right, that's all I needed there. I'm, I'm, I'm confused. I got These are too close together. So who is this? Right? Because she said, I sit as a queen. I'm not a widow. I will never mourn. So I'm pondering all this, and I'm thinking about it. I kept thinking, I've read that somewhere else. I know I've read that somewhere else. This is not the only place I've read this. So, you know, you get the concordance out, you're looking, 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 and you find it, and it's in Isaiah 47. So let's go to Isaiah 47. So you've got Isaiah 14 for Hillel. You've got Isaiah 47 for Babylon. <clears throat> Now, the King James is the only place that records that Babylon means the gate of God. Means the gate of God. <clears throat> it couldn't refer to the pagan city Babylon who built this giant ziggurat to be the gate to their gods, but it's the gate of God. So I got to ask, was she a worship leader for all the angels before she went astray? I don't think y'all can see the very bottom of that. I'm going to try to get a little more forward. <clears throat> so Isaiah 47, he starts out in verse 1. Now go down, sit in the dust, virgin daughter of Babylon. All right, now when I was studying the four, the four beasts in Daniel 7, I got really confused and I got really just kind of apoplectic. And so I looked up some of the Babylonian religion. And... The only thing that really struck out, because I mean, it gets into boring details, this God did this to this one, and this God did that to that one, and I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, who really cares? But it said that the original God of Babylon was Inanna. And though she was the mother of every other God in the Babylonian pantheon, she was a perpetual virgin. And that's when this made sense. Oh, virgin daughter of Babylon. See, he knew, but I didn't. Isaiah would have known, but I didn't. Virgin daughter, a perpetual virgin. Now, isn't there a church that tries to project all of this stuff about Babylon onto the mother of Jesus, queen of heaven, etc.? Yeah, buddy. You know they are. <clears throat> now, in verse 7... It says, <clears throat> you said, I will continue forever, the eternal queen, but you did not consider these things or reflect on what might happen. Now, listen, you wanton creature. Now, that was another one I had to look up. Wanton? She's a Barbie doll. Worse, she's a disembodied spirit that was a Barbie doll. Right? How can she be wanton? So I look it up. I look it up. And it means exactly what you think it does. So does she possess humans to be voyeuristic? What is, what is her infatuation with human sexuality? <clears throat> now listen, and you wanton creature lounging in your security and saying to yourself, I am and there's none beside me. Right? We quoted that from Revelation 18. I will never be a widow or suffer the loss of children. <clears throat> Revelation 18. Both of these will overtake you in a moment on a single day. 
Revelation 18, loss of childhood and widowhood. They will come upon you in full measure. Now look at this part. In spite of your many sorceries and all your potent spells. So did this once upon a time worship leader for the angels use her knowledge in the spirit of God and the spirit realm itself? Because face it, you know, the, the physical realm is like a dot in the spiritual realm. We know little about it. I mean, even when you've visited, gone around, traveled a little bit in the spirit, you still don't know much about it. You see is in a glass darkly, as Paul said. So it's everything's dark and murky, and people say, well, I thought I saw something, but I'm not sure it was all dark and murky. And I'm like, that's all you get. Pay attention. It's all you get. It's always dark and murky. Why? Because you're, you're in flesh. <laughs> you're looking through this. It's dark and murky. You're lucky you see it all. <laughs> you think about it for a minute. It's like, it's like the, <laughs> never mind. <clears throat> so in 10b, it says, your wisdom and knowledge mislead you when you say to yourself, I am, and there is none beside me. We read that in Revelation 8, 18. Then he says in verse 12, keep on then with your magic spells. He's taunting her now. Just go ahead. Knock yourself out. Keep on with your magic spells. And with your many sorceries, which you've labored at since childhood, perhaps you will succeed. Perhaps you will cause terror. Because that's what all he's trying to do is cause terror, right? So look at this word for childhood because angels were created fully functional. They didn't have a childhood. They didn't create, he didn't create angel babies and they grow up into adults like we are. Angels are created standalone adults. So what's childhood mean? Well, it can mean youth. So did she flip to magic spells newly created? Another question is, did she flip Hillel? And how much magic did they use on the ones who rebelled? These are all good questions. And I hope I'm on the other side before I get those answers. <clears throat> now, interesting stuff on, on Mystery Babylon. No one else will tell you that. No one else will tell you that. Now, four creatures, four great beasts. So let's go to Daniel, chapter 7. I had so much trouble with this. Even to the third writing, I was still trying to make it out to be uh, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. But it was verses in Revelation 17. It says, the beast you saw once was, now is not, and comes out of the abyss. The Roman Empire was at the time of John. We could never find a time when it wasn't that pertained to it's coming out of the abyss. And then finally I looked up the word abyss and I'm like, it's the abode of the devils in the heart of the earth. That can't be the Roman Empire. How can it be the Roman Empire? When is the now is not? That's how I see what this So four great beasts, who are these? <clears throat> now when you go to Daniel chapter 7, it says in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his night. Okay, Belshazzar ruled for three years. And in the third year he was killed when the Persians overtook the city. So why would God give Daniel a vision, including Babylon, when there's only two years left of the place? That's not very future. <clears throat> <clears throat> I, Daniel said, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Now, Yeshua said that there are four angels who control those four winds. So that begs a question. When is Yeshua going to send the four angels to churn up the sea to release these from the sea? <clears throat> Verse 3, it says, four great beasts... Now, that great beast is Rav Kiva. Rav Kiva. The Hebrew equivalent for beasts is Kaya. So it's Kiva in the Aramaic. It's Kaya in the Hebrew. <clears throat> and each came out of the sea. 
Rav Kiva. Four angels have control of this, so they are released from the sea. So I'm going to ask you some questions. Who put them in the sea? Who put them in the sea? We're going to look at three verses to suggest when they were put in the sea and if maybe they've been out and been put back a couple of times. First one we looked at a minute ago, Jeremiah 4 and verse 23. When the CD goes off, just let it go off and we'll finish up on Rev. Jeremiah 4 and verse 23. <clears throat> I looked at the earth, and it was tohu and bohu, and the heavens and their light was gone. Is that the results of Yeshua putting these four beasts in the sea? All right, let's go back here to Leviticus 6. And in the year I did this study, Chris was given a great message on the blessings of Leviticus 26. And then I about fell out of the chair when he got to verse 6. In Leviticus 26 and verse 6, he says, I will grant peace in the land and will make you, you will lie down and no one will make you afraid. I will remove savage Kaya from the land. Why were they in the land? Because the Canaanites were wicked beyond belief. And the Egyptians and the Canaanites and the Babylonians and the Hittites, they all practiced black magic. So were these beasts out and God put them in the sea when David was killing off all of the demon-possessed people? Because remember, when he told Joshua to go in the land, you kill everything that breathes. Why did he say that? Because there's an issue. He's not mean and cruel. There's an issue. There's an issue got to be cleaned. So my holy, clean, genetically pure people. Now, you know, back in the day, the racists used to say it was a racial thing. But I'm going to go with some of the people on the uh, sky white says there's only one race. <laughs> we come in different flavors, but we're all one race. So God brings a people out of Egypt that are pure to put them in the land. And I got verses to show you that was a mixed, that was mixed multitude. So that's black and white any way you want to look at that, that's black and white. But they were genetically pure, and he didn't want them mingling with the Canaanites. Because he said, you don't give your daughters, you don't give your sons, you don't mix with them. No breeding with them. Why no breeding with them? There's a corrupted seed there. That's another study for another time. It has to do with the Nephilim. <clears throat> All right. So let's look at John 12. John 12. You know, when, uh, when David killed Goliath, he said, I'm going to give your body and the body of all your Philistine army to the birds of the air for food so that the whole world will know there's a God in Israel. Well, the people inhabiting China, who at that point had a multi-thousand year reign, and the people in Egypt who had a multi-thousand year reign, and the people in, in North America that had a multi-thousand year reign, by the time David makes that statement, never knew. What world knows? What world is going to know there's a God in Israel when I kill you? The demonic world is going to know. Oh, we got a champion. All right. Perfect lineage. Seed of David, but by this time they've already figured out the house of David's where the Messiah is coming, so they do everything they can to kill it all off. Look how many Davidic kings killed off every heir to the throne in their jealous fits. And look at how Jezebel and her, her twin, Adaliah, tried to kill all the seed of the house of David. And God had to miraculously save Josiah and others. The only seed left of. Yeah, buddy. All right. <clears throat> John 12, verse 31. Jesus saying, Now is the time for judgment on this world, this cosmos. Who's he talking to? He doesn't mean the human world of Romans and Greeks. They didn't come to nothing after his death. Rome's going to continue on in Constantinople for another 1,400 years. The Roman Empire in Rome is going to continue on for almost 500 years, and then it's going to flip Holy Roman, Holy Roman, Holy Roman for seven more you know, resurrections. What world 
has to know. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. Who's the prince of this world? Hillel. So he's saying that I'm going to drive out Hillel when I'm lifted up. I'm going to draw all men to myself, but I'm driving out Hillel and his kingdom, and they're going to know judgments on them. So is this when he put the four beasts in there the last time? Now, the other thing you've got to understand about Bible prophecy, <clears throat> it's all about Israel. And I didn't bother to take the rabbi trail for this, but Israel and Judah were separated after the death of Solomon, and the northern tribes went pagan right there on the spot with golden calves under Jeroboam, and the southern kingdom of Judah remained righteous. And I've gone through the verses in Hosea where it says, I'm going to punish wicked Israel, but I'm going to save righteous Judah. Went through that extensively many years ago. So it's all about Israel. It's all about Israel. Let's go to Amos chapter 5. Not the Israelis, even though they are Israelis, but not the Israelis in Israel today, the modern Jewish state of Israel. They're Judah. They're Judah. This, this is not for them. This is for the Israelites, the other tribes. And as I wrote in, in, in the workbook, what comes next, it's going on already. It's starting to happen. I think it's the demonic forces setting the stage for when they're released from the sea. And when they're released from the sea, it's going to blow your mind. Because no one's looking there, right? Everybody's looking over here, shiny and pretty, Roman Empire, EU, blah, blah, blah. And meanwhile, what's fitting to come out of the sea is like the worst thing that could ever happen. But no one's ready for it, even though it's happening right under our nose. And I was late because I could not get past Babylon. Uh, the lion is Babylon. I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't get it done. I should have had this out in 2018. So when I get it out in 2022, guess who comes out with a book? The Return of Paganism. Jonathan Kahn. So I don't study their stuff until I get done writing. But Jonathan Kahn is speaking on this. Larry Allison speaking on this. Chuck Missler spoke on this years ago. But I did my research on my own. I, didn't, I don't look at other human authorities. Now, I'll preach using other human authorities because I want you to know I'm not a freak out here all by myself. There's a lot of really respectable people who are teaching what I'm teaching. And like I said, Sabbath changes everything. They teach this to a point. They don't teach it all the way. <clears throat> all right, Amos 5 and verse 18. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? All right, now as I just wrote in the book that I'm working on, there are several days of the Lord. One of them is the most intense part of the time of Jacob's trouble. Another day of the Lord is when we get rescued and harpazued to heaven. Another day of the Lord is the wrath of Avi. And there's another day of the Lord, a unique day known only to the Lord, when the house of Judah accepts Yeshua right before he comes to deliver them from their enemies. <clears throat> this one here <clears throat> is about the time of Jacob's trouble. <clears throat> He said, that day will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear. So the lion's the first beast, the bear's the second beast. As though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wire only to have Nakash bite him, the fourth beast. So here's three of the four beasts of Daniel. And this prophecy is written way before Daniel. Daniel went <clears throat> a little after 600 B.C. These guys, this is 800 B.C. This is almost 300 years before Daniel. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch darkness without a ray of brightness? It's all of there. It's all about Israel. So we talked to you uh, a couple of years ago on the Feast of Trumpets how the Great Sea, the Atlantic Ocean, was known to the Phoenician traders and their Israelite partners before David. Dan did not like their inheritance, remember? So they migrated north to Laish. And they renamed the city Dan. Remember, that's all in your Bible. And so they migrated to the north, and they became seafarers, and they were going out on the, on the, fish, on the, the trading uh, missions with the Phoenicians. They all spoke Aramaic. Aramaic was the language of that whole region. Later, it would be Greek. You know, the Septuagint was written in Greek. 
It was written by the leading scholars of the day at 300 B.C. The leading Hebrew scholars wrote that in Greek. I just wish my Septuagint had larger print because I can't really read it anymore. But the Septuagint differs from our Bibles because our Bibles are based on the Masoretic text. But the Septuagint is a better translation of your Old Testament than what you have in your hands. Interesting little side note. So when, is, when are these beasts coming out? From, released from their tomb in the sea. The time of Jacob's trouble. So let's say from the first airline hijacking in the 60s, we've kind of been in a time of trouble. We're not repenting. And the real deal's fixing to come about. And the real deal comes when these Rav Kiva get released. Now how long are they here? They continue until the judgment. Let's go to Daniel. We're just going to skim a couple of verses. And I'm going to show you how long these Rav Kiva are out on the earth. They don't go back in until it's all over. Daniel 7 verse 11. Then I continue to watch the little horn because of the boastful words this horn is speaking. It's amazing. This horn starts out little and ends up Rav. No one ever follows that. He's caught the little horn, right? And I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beast, right, the lion, the bear, and the leopard were stripped of their authority but allowed to live for a period of time. So I'm going to ask you, are they allowed to live? Uh, the great and terrible, the fourth beast, gets summary judgment at Jesus' return, instant death. The others are allowed to live for a time. Does that mean because they go in the spectacle? Does it mean because they're in Jesus' triumph when he marches around the world to show all of the demonic spirits still left in people, I have conquered your champion. I have defeated your best. The war is over. Anyway, Daniel 20, uh, 7 verse 26 says, But the court will sit, and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. That court sits right before Jesus comes down to the earth. So Avi comes up in the clouds of heaven, that's what it says and he holds court and he renders judgment and Yeshua comes down to exercise that judgment and we know from Revelation 19 we're coming back with him <clears throat> but you can't come back with Yeshua from heaven if you haven't already gone to heaven and no less a luminary than um, good grief I just lost his name Richard Ames came to the same conclusion uh, for all you world writers, you know Mr. Ames was in the living church of God. All right, so Daniel 8 and verse 17, he says this. Gabriel shows up and sends another angel to him and says, Son of man, he said to me, understand the vision concerns the time of the end. Was Daniel the time of the end? No. The Hebrew for time of the end is at ketz, which means the last boundary. Daniel was not the last boundary. All right, in verse 19, he says this. I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath. It is Ba'arit Za'am. It's on the other side of wrath. The other side of what wrath? The other side of, of that wrath that's the day of Je time of Jacob's trouble. On the other side of that wrath, that's when this vision is. That means we ain't here. Verse 26. The vision of the evenings and mornings that has been given to you is true, but seal up the vision. Not Antiochus. It concerns the Rav Tov, the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now Antiochus fulfilled parts of it, but that's how the demons are, aren't they? They give you a counterfeit. They fulfill just enough of it to, to throw you off the scent, but they didn't fulfill the most important part with that whole one horn growing out of that, that shaggy goat and pulling down a third of the stars from heaven. Antiochus couldn't do that. So why, why are we looking at him as fulfillment? He's not fulfillment. He is an example to be used of what will happen in the last days. He wasn't the, the real deal. <clears throat> Seal up the vision. Now I'm going to show you one thing I discovered this week and we'll close it out. Are we off the tape already? Yeah, yeah I figured so. To turn over to Revelation at the end of 3 and where chapter 4 starts. To give you some encouragement. That's what the Lord told me to encourage everybody. Encourage everybody. He's coming back soon. He's coming back soon. You're about to get your redemption. 
All right, so you see the end of chapter 3. To him who overcomes, I'll give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Right, that's the end of the church age. It's the end of the church age. You look at chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. The door's open. Come on up. When I was a kid, we had a cowbell. Cowbell rang. That meant get your rear into the house and get it there quick. On the double quick. If dad didn't see you run, you got a spanking. Trust me. I walked one time. <laughs> yeah, not a good idea. <clears throat> and the voice I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here. There's your rescue. It happens before the seals. We're there for this ceremony in chapter 4 and 5. And in 6, the Lamb opens the seals. And the Lord showed me to equate these four beasts with the first four riders. So we're gone before this happens. And I can show you more proofs. So I went through most of the book of Revelation the other day. I can show you more proofs. Over and over again, he says something, and then he, he'll say something about the wrath. So he gives you like five or six different ways to look at it from where we are to where the wrath of God comes. And they overlap. They're not uh, linear. It's circular. It's Hebrew circular reasoning. He tells you one way, then he tells you another way, then he tells you another way, and another way. In each case, we're gone before this stuff happens. So pray that you be accounted worthy to escape and to stand before the Son of Man. God bless everybody. It was great having you with us today. Remember, the Lord Jesus is coming back, and what you've got to do is keep his laws and commandments and clean your life up. And wash your robe in the blood of the Lamb because it's almost time. God bless you, and we'll have the great Eldress Barbara Dickerson next week. Good shot us, everybody!